another side effect of that meeting was that I have now had the opportunity to tell two magicians who have been influential oh influential to what I did for the Magic Castle audition that they had been influential for me and one of them is Rob Zabrecki um, he has one of the things that he's he's best known for is he's got a great character that he does magic as um, most magicians really even if they even if their character is just kind of a heightened version of themselves most magicians perform as a character um, it just helps make oops, finding sort of the voice for the writing uh, to be a little bit easier and <clears throat> take these out and Rob Zabrecki is one he's got a better sense of character than most people and most magicians do um, and he performs as and he calls and I asked him if he had a name for the character and he he didn't have a name like a like a regular normal name but he said enough people describe the character as the odd man so that's kind of what he calls the character uh, and it's kind of an appropriate thing because he's just kind of he's got this sort of lanky sort of physique and uh, <clears throat> and he is he is kind of odd in his demeanor he just he's one of these sort of kind of creepy um, you know he, he just kind of he doesn't say a whole lot he just kind of there and observing and just kind of kind of a little just creepy odd <laughs> So he uh, he told me that that's kind of what he refers to internally, the character as, as the odd man. So <clears throat> there we go. We are all built here. Let me light the portal and then let Eric know that it is... Uh, it is built... Again, he wasn't entirely sure that he wanted to put these in here, too. He wasn't entirely sure that he wanted to link up the portal yet, which is fine. That's his, uh, totally his prerogative. Uh, if he doesn't want to, we can wait, but I wanted to get it built. I'll light it on this side, and then if he wants to... Uh, not lighted on his side he can but then he did kind of acknowledge that it would make getting back and forth a little easier so so he may just decide to do it and that's stone and I'll just stick this up here I need to get my toolbox out of here this here and get the flint and steel which is Ah, it's starting to get used up. And I cannot put signs on here for the time being either. Plop. Okay. The, <clears throat> the portal is built. I probably need to build another plant of steel. I wonder if it's worth putting mending on. Okay, now. If I go through the portal now, it's going to search for a for a lit portal, and then it will decide. Um, oh, I should have kept some stone in my pocket. Uh, <clears throat> it will look for a lit portal, and when it doesn't find one, it will find a suitable location to build a new portal. Um, not necessarily in a convenient location. So, let's uh, let me grab these. And it will not light up the portal frame that he's already built. 
so that's not super convenient. So let me do this. Plop, plop, plop. Okay. <clears throat> I do like this keyboard, but I it might need a little bit more of an angle on it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, Zabrecki starts off his show, walks into the audience, and he walks in not from, like, a backstage area, but he walks in, um, in the same way that the audience does, and he's carrying a box. It's like a shoebox-sized cardboard box. Might actually be a shoebox. And he, uh... And he walks in and he looks through the audience and he finds someone Sorry, hang on a second. Um, and he walks up to somebody in usually in the front row and he hands them the box and he says This is not your box, but I want you to hang on to it. Then he goes up on stage and does his show And he never opens the box. It's not part of the show. There's not a reveal other magicians would would do something like have a like a card trick and have someone um the, the, the card would end up in the box, which would be kind of a cool trick, but um, <clears throat> it is oh, there's some gold in here nice oh, there's lots of gold in here okay, I'm going to repair some stuff um, so yeah, it would be it would be kind of like the location of a prediction or a selected card or something like that and that sort of would be the sort of the normal way of using it. And that's fine. That can be a really good trick. Um, but I just love the fact that the extra layer of mystery that it adds, that it's never referenced. I mean, he references the box. He'll check in on the person and make sure that they're still, you know, keeping the box safe. Like it's super important to him. And it kind of be, then becomes important to the audience. But it is it is not part of the act. It's just, it's almost like another character in the, in the show. So, and then when he gets done, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't do, he doesn't do anything with the box and he just walks off the stage. And instead of saying, you know, thanks for coming. Thank you very much. That's my show. He, he just basically walks off the stage Sorry if this gets noisy. Um, walks off the stage, snatches the box back from the person, and then then walks out the door. And that's it. That's that's the end of the show. Uh, which is which is a you know for a character who's like the odd man. Oh, yeah, that's right. We got extra people on. Okay. That might be enough to repair my stuff. I don't have much here, just the pickaxe mostly. Um, <clears throat> so it's a perfectly odd way of ending the show. But I like that air of mystery. There's that creepy modem Minecraft sound. Okay. So, whoa, what was that? Did I... I must have... The server must have thought that I fell farther than I did. Anyway, um, so I just really like that 
the sort of mystery that that provides and the fact that it's not referenced. So I got to tell him that and he was, he seemed appreciative because I think that was the way in which he intended it. It was just the same way that I took it. And then, uh, we, we talked about how most other magicians would turn it into something. It would become, as I said, there's a, there's a plot in magic called the card to impossible location. And a lot of people would use that box as the impossible location. Not a, a not a bad trick. I'm not poo-pooing that at all. It's just that's kind of the usual. And he wanted to do something unusual. Um, <clears throat> and it reminds me a little bit, or it's similar to uh, Helder Gamaras, who I went to go see his play, Invisible Tango, which I talked about. And one of the things that he does is he has a uh, he has a case in the lobby that it's a locked glass case and it contains a notebook and that notebook is his notebook and it contains like all the the mysteries and the secrets of the show and he sort of and he has a key to that case on the set and at the end of the show he selects somebody from the audience and then offers them the key and basically says here this will open up the case in the in the lobby and the show he talks a lot about mystery and how how it's important um important finding mystery or sort of appreciating the mysteries in life around you are um and uh he was basically saying you know if if you want you can open up the case take out the notebook you can't take the notebook home you can't take pictures of it but if you want, you can read the notebook and learn how all the tricks in the show are done. Uh, and thus ruining the mystery of what's in the notebook and ruining the mystery of the show. Or you can take the key home and it becomes like an, an impossible object. Then you can start your own collection of sort of impossible objects. And the show, the set of the show is decorated with impossible objects. <laughs> Oh, it's lit. Ah, worked. <clears throat> Excellent. Okay, there we go. This portal now goes to Eric Hulk's place. And uh, we can... Oh, there we go. Oops, name. Ah. <clears throat> um, so, so the show is decorated as, um, with these planet, oh, okay. Uh, the show is decorated with these signs, with these objects that are, they have kind of interesting, crazy stories um, and kind of mysterious origins. Um, so he sort of offers it up as, as if the person he gives the key to doesn't already have a collection of impossible objects that they, they can use this as their first one. Which I think is kind of cool. Um, well, only one I golem. Hi, Mr. Turtle. He escaped. Signs. I need signs. And we'll do this. Pop. How are you guys doing? Uh, someone's still farming, so there's relatively new villagers in there. Oh, okay. Let me go back in. Uh, so this can be th that person's first impossible object. Which I think, I think is a neat way of ending the show. And it does add a, sort of a layer of mystery to the thing. And there are things in the narrative of the show that are sort of intended in that way as like, oh, it's a mystery. Uh, so that that's, I think that's kind of a neat thing. And 
the so the notebook in the case and and and, and how to show and the um, and Zabrecki's box both were pretty influential on one particular trick that I is that right? <clears throat> one one of the tricks that I did in my whoa. Uh-huh. Uh, one of the tricks I did in my audition. <clears throat> so, that was, uh... So, one of the reasons I wanted to go see Invisible Tango again was because Helder greets people after the show uh, and takes pictures with them, signs autographs, that kind of thing. And so I wanted to, I wanted to, ha I wanted to tell him that, that, you know, his show not only sort of inspired me to try and add that to my audition, um, and, but that my audition had been successful. Um, so I, I just thought he might appreciate that. And I think he did. Um, so... And there's a third magician that is kind of um, kind of in that group of the people who sort of inspired me. He's an Argentinian magician named Manuel Yezer. Laser. L L A S E R. Um, <clears throat> oh, there's a white coat in there. Let's go see what he is. Oh, there's a couple of them. Cartographer, okay. There's a few of them. There's a librarian, anything obvious right up? Blast protection one, okay. No. Cartographer. I guess it's nighttime. Careful, otherwise I will spawn some phantoms. Um, so... And uh, I, I believe that, not believe, I know that uh, Manny Gazer, Laser, is going to be performing. He's going to be coming to the Magic Castle in a few months, in a couple months. So I believe I will have an opportunity. I have, com I have communicated with him on email. So I believe that I will have an opportunity to uh, to talk with him and, and convey that uh, to him in person, which I'm I'm excited for. He is uh, the reason he was influential is that he was talking in an interview on a podcast called Discourse and Magic, uh, and he was he is from Argentina, but he's very close with. Um, Juan Tamaris and, and a lot of the, the Spanish magicians and, and all of the Tamaris and the magicians in the Spanish crowd are always talking about adding um, emotion to their magic and, and that always seemed the sort of abstract thing to me and he was on the podcast talking about about some examples of it and it kind of suddenly made sense and uh, so I actually I sent him an email saying thank you because um, I actually think that there is something of a cultural um, kind of a cultural difference in the way the Spanish magicians and Americans sort of view emotion and art um, in that I, I think that with Americans it is basically when we think about emotional art it's it's basically we're just thinking about you know sadness or joy or sadness right we're either laughing or crying and the way he expressed it there was a lot more to it and it was he was talking about um this the sort of emotional texture that one might get from a from a 
you know, a well-crafted movie or a novel or something like that. And talking about things like suspense and, and mystery and um, comedy and other things that we might not necessarily think of as being emotions, or at least maybe I didn't um, necessarily be in emotions. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that he was, he was talking about. And that made a lot of sense to me. So, um, and that was a little bit of inspiration for me to be, to, to try and figure out, to put some, something else in one of the tricks that I was doing. It's an old trick. It's not my trick, but the, the way I had seen it published, there was basically no presentation. Uh, and so in coming up with a presentation that sort of fit me, I wanted to try and add a little bit of extra texture to it. And I, I think I did that. And, and there's, so there's the trick is, um, oh, that area looks so cool. Um, the, the part of the trick is I, in the reveal at the end of Blah. Um, <clears throat> the reveal at the end of the cards. Um, I, I kind of leave. I kind of leave it mysterious. I offered to leave some of the cards face down, uh, and that uh, I think adds a texture to it that um, that I was looking for. I, I rather like it the way it the way it plays. Uh, but so these are fixer uppers. Right, I got a bunch of these, so. Well, that was a creepy sound. So, fix dropper. So this is, that's the spoon. So these are tridents that people can take and fix. And add enchantments to it and repair them. And all that good stuff. So there we go. And they're cheap. They're a diamond. <clears throat> these have channeling on them. And, oh, this is the combat one. That's right. I need to, uh, I need to make some more of those. Hey, come here. Riptide. Okay. Nice. So, anyway, I'm kind of, it's kind of exciting that I can, we live in a world where I can meet three, three magicians from around the world. One American, one Portuguese, and one Argentinian. And and actually have a substantial sort of... Where they can have a substantial impact on, on the decisions that I make. Um, in, in sort of making my, making my tricks. Um, and, and that I can actually talk with them and interact with them. <laughs> Um, it's just, I think it's, I think it's super cool, but anyway, there we go. I think that's it. I've been recording. Let's see how long we've been recording for. Yeah. See, been talking for an hour. So we'll see if I make this one episode or two. Um, cause I've been talking pretty, pretty much throughout. Not that many pauses. So, um, we will see. I did not plan on a break, but uh, we will find out. Or I'll just treat this as a podcast because it's kind of what it was. Um, so anyway, that's. I think that's it. And um, oh, for for my birthday, and maybe I'll talk about this on. Might record more on Sunday on my birthday itself, uh, but I have. Birthday plans, uh, since couldn't go to the castle. On my birthday, we're planning on going to have a nice dinner. Um, probably just go to a, a steak place. There's a <clears throat> place in Glendale called Bourbon Steak, which is a rather nice restaurant. And uh, probably just go there and get a nice dinner. And then just enjoy... The, uh, enjoy the evening with uh, Chihuahua Power G. Uh, and then on Saturday, so tomorrow night, um, I'm actually going to go see a magic show, not at the castle. There's a magician named Matt Donnelly. He goes by the Mind Noodler. 
Um, he was Hillbill initially, but changed his moniker. Uh, he will be appearing on, I think I mentioned him and, and the fact that I think I, at that point, didn't know when it was going to be. He will be appearing on Penn and Teller Fool Us in September. Uh, and it's a, he's got a really cool act. And he's kind of a mentalism thing, but he's sort of uh, um, hillbilly, Appalachian, sort of folk sort of persona. Um, and that he... Uh, I think he's super funny. He he comes from an improv comedy background, and he's been writing for Penn and Teller and Piff the Magic Dragon and other people. And he effectively started doing magic on a dare from Penn, uh, which I think is funny. And he does, and he appears in the uh, the Penn and Teller Teach Magic Master Class, which you may have seen. It's a it's a 10 hour, 8 hour, something like that. It's a long multi-part class on on magic taught by Penn and Teller, which mostly means taught by Teller. But, um, and they bring on people, they bring on Johnny Thompson to help teach the Chop Cup, um, which is a an interesting prop, kind of, kind of related to the whole Cups and Balls Oh, it's looking at that. Is that ice? No, that's my glass. That's my, uh... Wow. My base is getting big. That's the glass for one of my areas downstairs. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Matt Dolly comes on and, and they sort of have... They kind of teach him how to... Johnny kind of teaches him how to do the chop cup. Uh, Johnny and Teller. Which is super cool. It's somebody who's relatively new to magic can have... Teller and Johnny Thompson as mentors, teaching them how to do the Chop Cup, which is something that Johnny Thompson is kind of famous for. So, anyway, um, yeah. Bark, bark, bark. I think this is the glass I was looking at. <laughs> cool. I need to do a little bit more with this. I can decorate this a little bit. Um, maybe put artwork on the wall and build out the wall. Meow. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, anyway, Matt Donnelly is doing a show in Hollywood on Saturday, and I am going. Um, so that, I think that will be fun. See him perform. I've never seen him perform in person before. I've seen videos of it. Um, and he's doing it largely because he needs uh, he needs just stage time uh, to sort of improve his act. Which I think is super smart of him. Um, but... Is that a boat stuck underneath the dock? Yes, it is. Oh, wow. What happens if I get in the boat that's stuck underneath the dock? Can't. Okay. Very cool. Uh, so anyway, that was kind of my consolation for not being able to go to the castle. So. Now that I've rambled on longer than I think I planned on, uh, I think that's it. I may figure out something to do and come on and record a little bit on Sunday before going to dinner. Um, it's my birthday. I can do that. Um, yeah. So, that's that. Anyway, thank you for listening. If you made it this far, thank you, thank you, thank you. And, um, um, and uh, I will see you next time. All right. Bye.